So in the very end of last lecture, we talked about the Bellman optimality equation. Let's just quickly recap what we have been talking about. So the Bellman optimality equation is uh, similar to Bellman equation, but the only modification is like when we take some policy pi instead of uh, taking action that is averaging over policy pi, but we take the max action. Okay. So it has like two equations. The first one is V star H S is equal to taking max over action A and Q star H S S S A. And the other part is the optimal Q function, Q star H S A is equal to intermediate reward plus we take expectation over the value in the next step. And in the last lecture, we kind of like also say uh, the Bellman optimality equation directly gives um, a policy, optimal policy, Q star A, S, which essentially this new policy we're just uh, taking it greedily respect to Q star. That is, we will, with probability one, take the action that equal to the action that maximizes the Q value, Q star value. A prime, Q star H, S A prime. Okay. So in the very end of the last lecture, we kind of like uh, reason about like we first initially like uh, start from guessing this Bellman optimal equation and uh, guessing this optimal policy, and then we we like do the proposition and the proof. We prove this policy pi star is actually indeed the optimal policy, which achieved the optimal value not only in the very first step but also in all h and all s simultaneously. Okay, so this is uh, what we concluded uh, at the very last part of the lecture. So today we're continue talking about this uh, this like optimal policy thing. And so the task we're going to talk about today is planning. So planning, you can think it's something similar to like policy evaluation, but uh, instead of like evaluating a fixed policy, now I want to find uh, the optimal policy. So the planning task is defined as follows: We're given with the uh, environment P. And also reward R. This is like similar to the setting of policy evaluation. We kind of like, we all know the environment. This is like environment P and R. And our goal is we want to compute the optimal policy. star. Okay, so similar to policy evaluation, the only difference is now we no longer just evaluate the value of some fixed policy, we just directly want to find the optimal policy. So we will basically introduce a couple of algorithms which can solve this problem. So the first algorithm, we can immediately like also take analog to the policy evaluation, where from policy evaluation, the basic algorithm we do is we use uh, essentially leverage the Bellman equation and do a dynamic programming based on that, and we directly do the policy evaluation. So similarly, in the planning here, we can also just directly leverage the Bellman optimality equation, which gives a recursive form on like how the value gonna propagate, and then we use dynamic programming to compute the optimal policy. So this gives the first algorithm that is called value iteration. So the first idea is basically leverage and uh, use uh, dynamo programming. I will just uh, short it just a DP. Okay. So the algorithm. Again, it's also very simple. 
let's call algorithm one of today, is called evaluation. Time, so we just call it VI. It turns out this value iteration is also a, a very important algorithm we will actually see throughout this class. So the value iteration consists of follows. That first we initialize. Similar to policy evaluation, we kind of like, we also initialize the value at the last step to be always zero because there is no future reward to connect, uh, collect after h plus one step is for NES. And then we just do the number of programming from the last step to the first step. So for h from the last step, capital H, h minus one, da 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 till one, we do the following. Essentially, we just copy the Bellman optimality equation. That is a Q star, HSA, is equal to RH SA and plus PH VH plus one star SA. We compute this for all state action pair at a step H. And then we do the the second Bellman equation, that is V star S, is equal to Q star S A, but taking max over action. We do this for any states. Okay, this is essentially just a copy the Bellman optimality equation. And then finally, we say well, optimal policy is just uh, It's just what we wrote here. That is an indicator of we take the argmax of Q star value. Okay. This for any HSA. Since we already proved in the last lecture, pi star is the optimal policy and uh, why value iteration works is kind of like pretty straightforward. This directly gives the op optimal policy. And we can also see this is like uh, the number of programming because if you look at the computation flow, what we did is again, very similar to the last <laughs> lecture. We first start with the VH plus one. Only difference is now it's no longer for some particular policies pi, but for the optimal policy. That is the S-dimensional vector. And then the first step, we compute the, this uh, Q star capital H, which is SA dimensional vector. And then we compute the V star H, which is S dimensional vector, and go on. Now. Okay. So essentially, we only take some linear to H computation, and we can compute the optimal policy. Any questions so far? Yes? Uh, is pi star inside the for loop or outside? Uh, the question is, is pi star inside the for loop? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it really, because we kind of like, we also already like given this value function um, policy like for any h, so it can be outside the, okay. the loop, yeah. But you can also put it inside loop, then you don't need to do any edge because you kind of, you already do follow. Both are fine. Okay. So for some historical reasons, I will also introduce uh, another algorithm, um, also doing the planning, which is the algorithm actually that, that does not leverage the Bellman optimality equation, but actually only use the Bellman equation. Okay. So that's the second algorithm called a policy, policy iteration.
Yeah. In general planning, you can have a lot of different planning algorithms, but I think those two are mostly commonly described in the intro textbook. So policy iteration. Um, so I think the value iteration, you can think the most important part is that we compute this value of V star, and we use the Bauman automatic equation to compute V star. Well, on the other hand, the policy iteration will maintain a policy, and we keep improving the policy at every iteration. So what are we going to do is we will initialize. Let's call it uh, pi 0. Okay. Pi 0, basically, we already know pi 0 is, uh, is a subject which, uh, which essentially is an h different, policy, uh, h different policy, which will have one policy at every step to be some arbitrary policy. On all states. So the initialization doesn't really matter that much. And uh, typically, you can either do some uniformly random policy, or you, you have some prior knowledge, and you just use the prior knowledge to initialize your policy. So the policy iteration also is a, it's like iterative algorithm. So it has a for loop. For t equal to 1, 2, da, da, da. Do following two steps. <coughs> so the policy iteration mainly consists of two parts. The first part is so-called policy evaluation. Okay. Basically, directly leverage the policy evaluation. That is, we will evaluate the value of pi t h, uh, um, pi t minus one, as a. So we will evaluate the value of previous policy at all SAH pair. So essentially leverage the knowledge we learned in the last lecture. We can essentially just run uh, dynamic programming using Bellman equation and to compute this value for all the state action at every step. And the second step is called policy improvement. So because our goal of planning is we want to find optimal policy, so it's not very useful if we just evaluate the value. We need to improve based on the current policy. So what we do is uh, we will update the policy. So this is a previous policy, that is a pi t minus 1. So we will update the new policy, pi ths, that is equal to our max a in a. Q pi t minus 1, H S A. This is also, we do this for all S A H pair. S A H pair. So what we're essentially doing is uh, we use the previous policy to learn, to evaluate its value. And then we use this value, essentially we take the greedy action, okay, greedy action that maximizes this value, and we make this as a new policy. So this is a slightly different approach than value iteration, which uh, this use Bellman optimal equation. Well, this essentially just use the original Bellman equation without using the Bellman optimal equation. So the question here is, uh, okay, we know that value iteration algorithm clearly works, clearly will find uh, like optimal policy. But like, uh, would this algorithm eventually converge to optimal policy? Like, or how many iterations we need to find optimal policy? So this is answered in the following theorem. We will say pi t is optimal. 
for any t greater or equal to h. That is, after each iteration of this uh, policy evaluation and policy improvement, we will guarantee this policy iteration already finds the optimal policy. Maybe in practice it can find optimal policy a bit earlier, but this is like guaranteed in the worst case. Any question about the algorithm and the statement so far? Okay, so we'll do the proof for, for like why this is true. So I think uh, because a lot of the uh, algorithm of uh, reinforcement in MDP is like based on dynamic programming, so a lot of proof is also based on induction. You can think it's like a mathematical version like to prove something related to dynamic programming. So we'll again do an induction. And we'll use induction hypothesis. That we will actually prove a stronger result, which says uh, this QH pi t, this is the value of uh, pi t, is equal to Q star h for any h greater than h minus t. Okay. So what is this, this induction hypothesis talking about? We have like h equal to 1, h equal to 2, and eventually we have h equal to h. And this is t equal to 0, t equal to 1, and the dot t equal to h. Okay, this is a step. So what we are talking about is uh, that in the very first step, that is a t, t equal to 0, only h equal to h, we have the optimal value. That is, in, only in the very last step, our value equal to the optimal value, and everything else is, is not equal to optimal value, or we don't guarantee it equal to optimal value. Uh, in the second step, we're guaranteed not only the very last step, our value is equal to optimal value, but also the second last step, our value is equal to optimal va value. Okay, but we don't guarantee everything else. And so we're, what we are saying is essentially in every step, we're guaranteed one more step so that uh, our value is equal to the optimal value, and eventually in the H step, we guarantee all the value is equal to the optimal value. So this is what this induction hypothesis is talking about. So let's start the induction. We first look at the base case. Base case, we only need to check t equal to 0. Our induction is true. And when t equals 0, all we say is the, policy, the value at the very last step is equal to the optimal value. So the value at the very last step is uh, q pi 0 hsa. And uh, we know this is the value at the very last step. And we know value at the very, value at the very last step is basically just an intermediate reward of I receive, that is RHSA. And then we no longer have any future reward. Okay? This is basically all the reward I'm going to get uh, in the future. And then we realize because this Q value already specified both state and action, so this both S and A are fixed. None of them are depends on the policy. Okay? So Although this is like arbitrary policy, but it doesn't really affect the value at the very last step. So this is also equal to Q star HSA. So the base case is, is correct.
OK. So then we say suppose the hypothesis. Suppose the induction hypothesis is true for step t. Or for iteration t. And let's look at the, let's examine t plus 1. So basically, by looking at t plus 1 situation, we need to look at the policy of t plus 1 situation of s. Okay. I will just use this notation because uh, we already see in, the, in this, this like a policy evaluation, and all the policies are like a determinants of policy. And we know by definition, this is equal to arg max a of uh, QH pi t SA. It's equal to the greedy policy, uh, which look at the value of the previous policy. Okay. This is directly by PI algorithm, policy iteration algorithm. And uh, we examine for any h greater or equal to h minus t. Okay. And we also know, because by, by hypo induction hypothesis, we know for any h that is greater than capital H minus t, this q value is actually already equal to q star. So we know this is equal to arg max a of uh, q star sa. This is by induction hypothesis. And then finally, we remember like the optimal policy is basically just the greedy policy with respect to Q star. So we know this is just equal to pi star HS. OK. So this essentially just already implied that for any h greater than h minus t, I'm just copy copy this uh, precondition here. We kind of say for any step that is larger than this uh, h minus t, we already know the policy we learned up to t minus 1 iteration is already optimal. Those policies is equal to the optimal policy. Okay. And the final argument is just use the argument we essentially already said in the last lecture. That is, we look at the q h minus 1 pi t plus 1. We notice this Q value and this SA only depends on all the future policy, like pi h t plus 1, pi h plus 1, t plus 1, and da 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 till pi h t plus 1. Okay. So the important part is uh, this Q value, although at the uh, h minus 1 step, doesn't really depend on the policy at h minus 1 step. The reason is uh, h, the action at h minus 1 step is already specified in this A, which basically, uh, like, uh, the policy at h minus 1 step actually doesn't affect this action A. So that's why it doesn't depend on the intermediate policy. It only depends on the future policy. And we already know all of them are equal to pi star.
So this just implies that this is also equal to Q star h minus 1, I say. The reason is uh, because the policy is optimal policy, so the value is also optimal value. So now we can just re-index a little bit, because now we say for any h greater than capital H minus t, we have a value equal to the optimal value up to h minus 1 step. So this is also equivalent to say, for any h, we just do some re-indexing, for any h greater than capital H minus t minus 1, we have our value q pi t plus 1 h equal to the optimal value q star h. And this is uh, what we want to say in the induction hypothesis. And so we finish the proof. Uh, you, you're asking why did, did, why did this is true again? OK, yeah, so, so the question is why base case is true. Uh, as we already said, the base case look at the value at the very last step. And uh, if you expand the value, essentially, is the cumulative reward, that is summation of all the future reward. So in the very last step, the reward that we're going to receive is only at the very last step. That is RH, and we don't have any future reward. And this RH only depends on the state action pair, which is already specified here. So, so the, both of them are fixed, so, and they, they don't depend on the policy. Okay. So that's why the, those two are. Yeah. Um, so does policy iteration and evaluation converge to the same policy at the end? Yes, a good question. I, I think uh, if, uh, um, I think up to some like tie, tie breaking, I think they are, they are equal. Yeah. But if they are tie breaking, maybe they will converge to a different action, but that's fine. Yeah. That's also another good question. Uh, I think, uh, like, uh, the question is uh, asking about the speed of policy iteration versus uh, uh, value iteration. So from what we can see here in this episodic setting, and, uh, and if we're talking about the computation in the worst case, and we will see probably the answer is value iteration is a lot faster. And the reason is uh, here we need to do H iteration. And in every iteration, we, we need to do this like a policy evaluation, which is already doing like a Bellman equation. And some people will argue for this Bellman equation because we're evaluating only the an optimal policy, uh, only the deterministic policy. So that's why we can do this uh, policy iteration a little bit faster than uh, policy evaluation a little bit faster than this uh, Bellman optimal equation because this actually look at all the A. Well, this only look at the action that taken by the policy pi t minus one because this is deterministic. But the problem is uh, this argmax is also like look at, looking at all A. So essentially, the computation of two steps is roughly the same as uh, just doing one pass of this Bellman optimal equation. So you can think like just one iteration is roughly equivalent to like uh, the entire value iteration algorithm in this episodic setting. So I would say the worst case performance, like in theory, looks like value iteration is uh, faster. But I do see like people in online like arguing, saying like this is. Uh, in practice, uh, policy iteration can be faster. And I think it probably makes more sense in the, in the infinite horizon, this kind of setting where they can look at some stationary policy where this pi doesn't depend on h. And, uh, and so you can do this. Uh, you, can, you don't need to do this like for h times. You just need to do this for one time. But this is a little bit beyond this class. I don't want to like, talk too much about it. OK. So 
So this essentially concludes what I want to talk about for planning algorithm. Of course, there are some other planning algorithm, but for the purpose of this course, I think we will like to ex examine like more challenging setting and develop guarantees for those kind of settings instead of talking about like a lot of algorithm achieve the similar objective. Okay. So before we conclude the planning part, I would like to also mention a little bit about the uh, episodic setting versus uh, infinite horizon setting. Okay, just provide some co comment. So since we're already talking about like the policy situation and some stationary policy, so we will just comment about the difference between those two. I think uh, uh, throughout this class, we will just use uh, episodic setting. I think the reason is although we kind of like, we have an additional index of uh, this little h, but everything the, the underlying mechanism is much clearer. We just do like dynamic programming. Well, in the infinite horizon, this kind of setting, we'll say like we'll say a little bit. I think the in, the key quantity there is uh, is instead of like how many steps you end uh, the per episode, they saying like you have infinite number of episodes, uh, infinite number of steps, but instead you kind of discounted the future reward by some discounting factor gamma. Okay, this gamma is smaller than one, and this is a discount factor. So basically, it will be much clearer what is this setting uh, if we look at the value function. So essentially, the MDP in the infinite horizon this kind of setting is very similar to our setting, which has a set of states, set of action, and uh, reward, transition probability. And the only difference is now we no longer have a finite horizon. We have a discounting factor, gamma. And the value of a states and a policy pi. Now it's computed in the following way. That is, is I will take expectation over all the future as a pair, and we look at the summation of all the future reward. Okay. By infinite horizon, that is, uh, we're looking at all the summation of future reward, that is summation from the very first step, h equal to 0 or h equal to 1. It doesn't matter much. But we kind of like we summation over to the infinity, okay? Or, or summation over, because it's infinite horizon, and of course, uh, for infinite horizon thing, we cannot just summation some like something constant because that will like blow up. So we need to discount the future reward. That is, uh, for any reward happens at h step in the future, we will discount it by gamma to the power of h, and then we can like uh, summation and times the reward we receive at h step. Okay, let's say this is a, S0 equal to S. And we know if the reward, for example, is bounded in 0 and 1, so the maximum reward you're going to receive is summation gamma to the cap power of h. And we know this is like geometric series uh, where with the, this factor gamma is smaller than 1, so this is clearly, this summation is clearly converged to something and it's, it, won't, it won't blow up, so everything is well defined. And I think the beauty of infinite horizon setting is uh, we can possibly talking about uh, like a stationary policy that a pi doesn't depend on h, and also the value doesn't depend on h. Okay, so we can just consider everything like uh, as something stationary. P is also stationary. So we will first talk about. Uh, how are we going to relate this two settings, like, uh, like why we can talk about the episodic setting without loss of generality? The reason is uh, essentially, although this is an infinite horizon, this kind of setting, but we can more or less uh, count the maximum possible cumulative reward after a step H.
since we kind of say this reward is always in 0 and 1 to, by normalization, so we see this maximum possible reward is after step h is basically just a summation h prime equal to h to infinity and gamma to the h prime. This is already assuming I always get the maximum reward that is one after step H. So this is a maximum possible like discounted cumulative reward we can receive, which we can easily compute this summation is equal to uh, gamma H. one over gamma over one. Uh, I believe something like that. Yes. Okay. So we can clearly see because this uh, gamma is something strictly smaller than zero, uh, strictly smaller than one, sorry. So this is this uh, like cumulative reward after step H is actually geometrically decreasing. So it's decreasing extremely fast. So we can essentially count uh, how many steps. Uh, so for example, if I want all the remaining possible cumulative reward is smaller than epsilon, it turns out you can essentially solve, solve this as long as uh, h is greater or equal to, up to some constants, one, one, minus, uh, one over one minus gamma, log, 1 over 1 minus gamma times epsilon. So which up to some logarithmic factor is equal to 1 over 1 minus gamma. So this is up to log vector. So what we are saying is uh, after this amount of steps in the infinite horizon setting, all the re reward summation together is, are, is very, very small. So epsilon. And in a lot of scenarios, like in the learning scenario, we don't really care about this small difference epsilon because we have statistical noise. And in that kind of scenario, basically, we don't care. And so what we are saying is this infinite horizon can be also viewed as uh, some finite horizon set setting, where this is essentially the effective horizon. So what we are seeing is up to a small arrow. Infinite horizon discounted setting. can be treated as a finite horizon. With effective uh, Horizon that is h tilde equal to o tilde that one over one minus gamma. Okay, so this basically set up the 
connection between this uh, infinite horizon and the finite horizon setting. That is at least like when we get the result to of the finite horizon setting, and up to some error, we can transfer the result to the infinite horizon setting. So the second thing is, uh, what is the like why we're we talking about a finite horizon setting uh, in this course? I think it will be clear if we look at the Bellman optimality equation there. Bellman equation or Bellman optimality equation. We just uh, look at here. So Bellman optimality equation in that kind of case is like Q star SA is equal to RSA plus. Now we need to discount the value at the next iteration. So we're adding a gamma here. And then we're doing a pH. And then we have a V star. SA. And then V star S is equal to max A. Q star S. SA. So essentially, the Bellman optimal equation is we just drop the index h, but uh, we have the discount factor gamma here. So then we can talk about the value iteration. So we just recall in the episodic setting, the value iteration essentially is a run Bellman optimal equation by dynamic programming, which we run this equation from h equal to capital H till one. Well, in the infinite horizon setting, there are essentially two possible ways. One is that we can do this truncation, and we can convert it to episodic setting. And where we essentially need to consider a non-stationary reward and a non-stationary policy and value again, and then everything go back to the first setting. Or we can directly use the stationary treatment, where instead of doing general programming from capital H to 1, because there is no finite horizon, what you can do is so-called like a fixed point iteration. Okay. I will just intuitively explain what this is about. So essentially, this is a, we run this Bellman equation, like we do. We have, have V star, we compute the Q star. And we have Q star, we compute the V star. Kind of like we repeat the process. And by fixed point iteration means like we, we're guaranteed after some iteration, this process will converge to some value. Okay? Because we use Q star to update V star, uh, V star to update Q star, Q star to update V star. We kind of like we might go back and forth in the very beginning, and then eventually we're going to converge to something. Okay. And uh, this is uh, essentially how equivalent of this dynamic programming in the infinite horizon setting. I personally feel it's a little bit more complicated to, to analyze that kind of thing. And later, we have a more complicated setting, like a function approximation or like a multi-agent scenario. And by looking at this dynamic programming, it's much clearer what everything is happening. And it turns out for fixed point iteration, you can basically say it's up to some, up to some arrow epsilon. So we will converge in some H2 effective horizon steps. Okay. So that is, so if we run this uh, uh, fixed point iteration for H2 steps, and eventually we will converge to something up to some small epsilon, small epsilon arrow, which again, intuition is like similar to dynamic programming. Any questions about this part so far? I guess I would just quickly go over the difference between 
similarity and difference between this episodic setting and infinite horizon setting. And for the later course, we'll still focus on the episodic setting. Okay, so this finish essentially where we want to talk about the planning. Okay, this, let's just recall the setting of planning. Planning is so uh, we know environment that is transitioning on a reward and we want to compute the pi star optimal policy. And in this setting, basically everything is already done and we have reasonably good solution. And however, this is essentially why we call it planning. Well, I would, well the, the name of this course is called reinforcement learning. So we still need to do the learning component. And by doing learning, I think a lot of people kind of like understand learning or define learning as we want to kind of like learn optimal policy by interactions through the unknown environment, by exploring the unknown environment. So the very important thing is this is like, a, in practice, a lot of time, this environment is unknown. Like as a baby, we want to learn how to work or how, how to do some like special skills. Like we essentially explore this world which is unknown to the ba ba baby or to a lot of people. And in that kind of scenario, we need to do some learning. By learning, we essentially means we want to estimate uh, both transition and reward using samples. That is, I don't know the transition probability, but I by like uh, visiting this state multiple times and see what it states the transition to, then what what the next state it transition to, and we will essentially use some statistical tools to estimate what is the transition probability and the reward. So okay, so when we talk about this learning set, we inevitably need to like introduce some statistical statistical tools uh, to to talk about this, which. Uh, which essentially will be the next topic that we're going to go over. So let's first look at what kind of uh, statistical questions we'll be faced at. Let's uh, consider a very simple example. The simple example is like uh, um, we can consider we want to estimate the transition probability. to new states. So a very special case is we could consider, for example, this new states, we only have like two possible new states. And we are only look at the probability of starting from one specific assay pair, like one fixed assay pair, to two possible new states as prime. This kind of problem is basically the same as, uh, for example, I want to look at some coin toast problem. Okay. Because we're starting from some fixed essay pair, so let's just say that we only have like one essay pair. And we are looking at the transition to two new states, and we're essentially similar to a coin toast, where every time the new states is, has two possibilities. Let's just talk about the 
coin toss here, we have like either hat or, or tail. And let's say for hat, we know in reality it's like with probability p and with probability for equal to tail, it's probability with one minus p. So this is like Bernoulli, this is like Bernoulli random, uh, random variable with parameter p. The question is uh, here, we don't really know the, the parameter p. We want to estimate it. by looking at a lot of samples, that is x1, x2, and da 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 till xn. We will do an independent draw out of this, uh, of this Bernoulli random variable, and we want to use x1 to xn to <laughs> estimate the parameter p. Essentially, this is a problem of learning the environment where we, we look at uh, many independent draw of the next states, and we want to estimate what is probability to visit state 1 and what is probability to visit state 2. And uh, so we know by law of large number, we know the average one over n, summation i from one to n, xi. Let's call this hat is, is equal to value of one. This hat is, this tail is equal to like a, equal to value of zero. And we know this summation of uh, xi and taking average uh, divided by n is going to converge to this p as n go to infinity. And for those of you who have learned a probability class, we know this convergence is called almost surely convergence. If you don't, if you don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, almost surely convergence as with probability one. Okay. So this somehow says some phenomena like when we have infinite samples. However, uh, to a learning community, community, this might might not be that satisfactory because this essentially only tells you when n goes to infinity. You don't really know how large is enough. For example, whether a million samples is enough, or whether a billion samples is enough, like when this convergence is going to happen, that is quite unknown by this like law of large number. So for this class, uh, like uh, in the learning theory course, we care a lot, a lot about sample capacity, like because in practice we never have like this infinite number of samples. So we really want to know what, like what kind of data sample complexity or how many samples we need so that this estimation can happen and so that we can accurately learn some like transitions so that we can accurately learn some optimal policy. So this is why we need to introduce a better tool. Okay. So a, a sharper tool, okay, we can see. Essentially, we need to not only say this will converge to the, to the parameter like almost surely, we want to have something So that we can say the one over n, this average, summation from one to n xi, subtract by p, we want to say this difference is upper bounded by some function of n. So hopefully we can say this n, this, this function is something like a scale as one over square root of n or one over n or something basically decrease with n. So in that case, we're in some good shape because we can see when n goes to infinity, like that is so in a large sample scenario, we're guaranteed this, will, this difference will be smaller and smaller 
And we also not only have like this asymptotic guarantee, we have also non-asymptotic guarantee that we can actually say for this less than epsilon, we, all, we only need this number of n greater than something depends on epsilon. Um, so this is like what we want to develop over this class or maybe a, a bit of next class. And for those who are familiar with probability, you know this tool is kind of called concentration inequality. So it will be the essentially the single most important mathematical tool we're going to use when we analyze any learning algorithm. So this goes to the second part of the lecture. We'll talk about the concentration inequalities. So there are a lot of different concentration inequalities. And we will only introduce a few concentration inequalities um, that is most relevant to this course. And uh, essentially, we introduce four of them, but three of them are kind of like extension. We will only like briefly talk about like how, like what is the statement and how they're gonna, how they gonna, we're gonna derive them like from the original one. And we will focus on the original one today. So before we talk about this concentration inequality, uh, we first want to introduce a, a bit of like notion, no notation so that we can facilitate our discussion. So we'll talk about some big old Big O notation. So I think the introduce of big O notation because a lot of times uh, when we when we if we want to do all the mathematical like very rigorous like talking about we talk very precisely about what is a constant like is two or four we need a lot of computation and it kind of like also hurts a little bit about big picture. So a lot of scenario, I think uh, we don't really care about some precise constant, whether it's two or four or, or like a 10 or something. So we will use some big O notation to hide the constant dependence or sometimes even the log dependence. So we will essentially have a few notation that is like big O, little O, and, uh, and this uh, H. And we also have omega dependence, like a capital omega, little omega. And uh, we will also have another set of notation that is O tilde. This is only hiding a constant factor. This is hiding the log factor. We'll, we'll talk about rigorous definition here. Okay, so basically, those set of notation, like uh, tilde version, non tilde version. Tilde is about hiding the log factor. This is, doesn't hide the log factor. This is only hide a constant factor. And O is uh, like essentially less or equal to theta is equal to and omega is greater or equal to. And we will talk about uh, rigorous definition. Uh, is, uh, the question is, uh, transition probability stable over the time? You're talking about whether pH depends on H. Is that the question? So in our episodic formulation, it doesn't necessarily need to be stable over the time. So I think the, the way we do the learning is we will play the game for multiple episodes. So essentially, we'll play from the beginning and then do each step. That is one episode of the game. Essentially, like you, you, you imagine you learn, you learn to play Super Mario by not just playing it once. Like you play it like for a thousand times, and then you're gonna learn it. Okay. So, so I think uh, what what we are. Uh, so the question is like. Uh, Essentially, we say P1, we have like P1, P2, and da 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 pH, right? And this, uh, this can be all different in the episodic setting. And the way we're going to learn this is, uh, for example, we play the first game of Super Mario, and we collect uh, one sample, S one trajectory, S1, A1, S2, and da 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 till SH, AH. 
This is like a first trajectory. And then we, we go through the second trajectory. That is uh, another S1, A1, S2, A2, da 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 till SH, AH. This is like when I play the second game. Okay. So in both trajectory, or like, and we can have like multiple trajectories. At a different trajectories, those transition probability will be the same. So this will be the same transition probability happening at the very last, last step of both trajectory. Uh, if we cannot restart the game, then we cannot learn it, of course. Like if you only have one trajectory, then there is no way to estimate the transition, that's true. So in order to do statistical estimation, you have to have multiple samples. I think there is no setting that says uh, you can use one sample to learn. This is statistically impossible. Yes, and I think in that kind of scenario, you need to kind of assume there is some correlation between this transition. I, th I think we, we, we won't talk about this in the class, but essentially people also study some like uh, adversarial change of the, of the P and in the setting like when you say it's, uh, like if you only visit it once, then basically there are a lot of impossibility results. You cannot say, you cannot say anything reasonable if, if P is like changing arbitrarily in the worst case. You have to say it like changes smoothly or it has some correlation over the time so that you can do the prediction. Like for example, in a financial mark like in a in a financial market you can you can you kind of say, oh this is similar to the past history of some part. Where essentially you kind of use some human prior to establish saying this transition is similar to that kind of transition in the past. You cannot see anything strong if you say there can be arbitrarily changed and I only have one sample. That's just not possible. That's a good question. Okay. So regularly we will say we define the big O notation. We say that uh, GX is uh, less or equal to some capital big O of FX. Where for generality, we say this x is a vector in Rd. Okay, so this is not a scalar, this is a vector in Rd. We say this gx is a little o of fx if following happens. That is, uh, there exists some constant c that is greater or equal to 0. And uh, there exists also at a very large number, n greater or equal to 0, so that for any x such that the smallest coordinate of x is greater than n, then gx is less or equal to some constant times cx. Okay. So informally, you can think this capital O is just hide some constant factor c. Okay. Basically, this is saying when x is large enough, okay, when any, constant, any coordinate of x is large enough, then we will have the relation that gx is less or equal to some constant times cx. Okay. You can just intuitively think this high some constant here. And similarly, we will also define some tilde notation. Essentially, we will say if gx is less or equal to big O tilde of fx, If there exists some constant c greater than 0, and for n large enough, and also there exists some polynomial p, so that for, so that for any x, again, for any x, so that the minimum of uh, 
coordinate is greater or equal to n. That is large enough. And we have uh, gx less or equal to c times fx and times some polynomial times uh, log fx. So again, you can just think this uh, O tilde is a, is a notation where it hides not only the constant, but also some logarithmic factor. And everything happens when x is large enough. And similarly, we will define the little o notation. Little o essentially, we say gx is less or equal to little o of fx. And the following happens. I think the intuitive understanding of little o versus big O is like big O is smaller than some constant, but like probably it can be similar order. Like they just up to some constant difference. Well, little o essentially gx is strictly smaller than, than fx when x is like large enough. So how we describe it? Essentially, we will say for any constant c, no matter how small it is, there exists some n, so that n, when n is large enough, that for any x such that uh, the minimum i of xi is greater or equal to n. We have gx smaller than constant times cx. Okay. So the major difference now is uh, we're not saying there exists some constant. For example, exists some constant can be like 2 or 4. But this is saying for any constant, no matter how small it is, it can be like 0 0.1, it can be 0 0.001, it can be like 10 to the minus 6 or something. But this is saying no matter how small the constant is, as long as I make my x to be large enough, I can always make this gx smaller than some constant times uh, fx. Okay. So this is much smaller than the previous big O case. So you can think this, is, well, this will directly implies that gx over fx goes to 0 for large x. So for x large enough, we can, we can say the ratio will eventually go to 0. Okay, so this is much smaller than the, the, the big O notation. So we have already, essentially, you can also say this uh, little o is like also the, the log, polylog addition, has a polylog, additional polylog log factor. So we have introduced the first set of uh, notation. So the remaining set is essentially we can just defined by the capital O or little o. So we say fx is greater or equal to omega gx. This is essentially large up to some constant. This is equivalent to gx is smaller than the capital O, big O of fx. So big O is like less or equal to up to some constant, and cap big, o big omega is like greater or equal to up to some constant. And finally, we see fx is equal to theta gx if they are basically equal up to some constant factor. So this is saying, this is equivalent to say, fx is not only less than big O of gx, but also greater than big omega of gx.
Okay. So after introducing the all notation, we will kind of like, uh, start to uh, talk a little bit about the concentration inequality. So just recall that uh, our objective is we want to have a much sharper bounds that basically tells us something about uh, how close it is from the sample average, that is the summation from 1 to n, to, to its expectation. Like we see the expected value of xi. So we want this difference to be less or equal to fn. So this is what we call concentration inequality. And it turns out whether this inequality, inequality can happen really depends on like a, what is the relation between different xi and the, whether they have some dependency or something. So one of the very basic case we can start with concentration inequality is we look at the independent random variable. The first case is uh, we say this is independent. And this is a very important assumption because they're independent, so we, we, we kind of like expect uh, the, the difference between the random variable to expectation is like some noise. And then because they're, the noise are independent, so they're going to fluctuate, eventually cancel out for a lot of times. And this is the whole reason why we can have concentration. So we will do the first part, that is the concentration inequality. for independent random variables. Okay, I will just use the short, like RV is like a random variables. So we directly introduce the key result today, and we will leave the proof to the next lecture. So the key result we're going to do this for is uh, we call it Hoffding's, theory, Hoffding's inequality. Let's do theorem two. So the statement of theorem looks like the follows, that we say let x1, x2, da 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 till xn be independent var random variables. This is like the key assumption, they're independent. And uh, the other structure is uh, with probability one. We know xi is bounded. Ai to bi. And this is essentially OK for our setting, because a lot of times in reinforcement, we just consider bounded random variable. For example, reward is in 0, 1. And so the value is like in 0 to h or something. So we say the, the random variable is always bounded with probability 1. OK, so let's just use the notation at ri equal to bi minus ai, which is the range of xi. Then for any t, greater than zero, we see the probability of summation i from one to n of xi minus exi greater or equal to t is less or equal to something exponential to the minus two t square over summation i from one to n i square.
I will briefly say what does this mean. Um, why this is called a concentration inequality. We can think this uh, whatever the distribution. We can look at some distribution of summation xi. Okay. So we know summation xi is, uh, has the mean, which this is the, the mean, which is expectation of summation xi. And we expect this is a, as a new random variable, let's call it v or, or something like z. So this z has a mean which is equal to this, and we expect some distribution, probably something look like this. Okay. I don't really know whether it's like this, but, but I expect it, something like this. So what this statement is saying is a probability of uh, this z random variable exceeding the, 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 this expectation by amount of t. So this is difference of t. So it says it will exceed the expectation by amount of t. And, and look at all the probability that goes beyond t. Okay. This is the probability of this random variable z is going to be greater than the expectation, at least by amount of t. So what we are saying is that this probability is exponentially small regarding to t. In fact, it decreases like something e to the minus t squared or something like that. Okay. So this kind of like says, uh, essentially it says the probability of uh, going out is like very, very small. So you can imagine like this is, uh, instead of some picture look like this, it might be something like uh, super sharp. So the probability is like ex very small. And so most of the mass will be concentrated around like this region. So this is why it's called concentration inequality. Okay. So this is only one side, one side of result. You can also directly flip it to the other side. Like this is less or equal to minus t, and you get the same result. Okay. So basically, it came most mass in the middle region. And so this is why we call it a concentration. Okay. And in the next lecture, we will further talk about uh, what this concentration inequality talk about, and we will also talk about uh, uh, how we're going to derive this uh, concentration inequality.